and welcome to GameSack. Gonna check out the Evercade today. And this thing just showed up in the mail a few days ago with a whole mess of games, and it surprised the hell out of me. Turns out that I have a bunch of emails about this that I didn't read. I'm sorry about that, but I really wasn't gonna cover it, but then I thought, let's see what the Evercade is all about. So let's take a closer look at the system itself. Evercade is a handheld system made by Blaze Entertainment who are based in the UK. You can play games on the built-in 4.3 inch widescreen display or on your TV in 720p by using an HDMI cable. As for the controls, it has a Super Nintendo style layout with a diamond configuration and two shoulder buttons, though the names of the buttons are in different places. The system uses interchangeable game cartridges with multiple games on each. I do like the plastic clamshell cases as well as the fact that manuals are included with them. There are two versions of the Evercade. The lowest cost one is 80 US dollars and includes just one game. The premium version costs $100 and it comes with three games right in the box. Each game cartridge is advertised as selling for $20 each. The system also comes with a USB charging cable. On a full charge, they claim about four to five hours of battery life, which isn't a ton. However, based on my tests, that is pretty accurate. The system does not, however, come with a mini HDMI cable that you'll need if you want to play games on your TV. Internally, the Evercade is using a 1.2 GHz Cortex A7 ARM processor for its emulation duties. The screen resolution is 480 by 272 pixels, which is the same as a Sony PSP. Provided is a menu button which allows you to set the brightness for the built-in screen as well as select if you want to play games in the original size or stretch to 16 by 9. During the gameplay, the menu button can give you a few more options. First and foremost are the save slots. You can also adjust the picture size as well as exit back to the main menu of the cartridge. As for the quality of the game screen itself, it's fine. I mean the colors generally look pretty good. But since it has non-integer scaling, there's a bit of shimmering during the scrolling on pretty much every game. Fortunately, it seems to be a fairly quick screen as I don't notice much blur at all. Playing via HDMI is much preferred in my opinion. Unfortunately, there are no scaling options. So that means you'll get varying pixel sizes due to the non-integer scaling, and again shimmering in the scrolling. The emulation is mostly fine. The Genesis emulator is called Blastem, which is a cycle-accurate emulator on the PC which I've personally never tried. What's cool though is that it was ported to the Evercade by the emulator author himself. Sadly, this particular emulator is extremely blurry, especially when you're connecting it via HDMI. I can't seem to find any information on what other emulators are used here. The sound emulation is mostly okay, but there are some issues which I'll get into when I talk about the games. From what I understand, the emulators reside on each cartridge itself, so it's possible for a set of games to use a newer and better emulator in the future. Going back to the controls, you can't change the defaults at all. For example, NES games use these two buttons, and I'd rather use these two. The Genesis uses A, B, and Y. Playing Genesis games on any controller with a diamond configuration like this is usually not the best experience. As for the buttons themselves, they feel pretty good. Even the D-pad is nice. I do not enjoy how the menu button is right below the D-pad, however. It's extremely easy to accidentally hit during gameplay, especially when you're playing a fighting game. I've also accidentally hit the start button, which is below the 8 button. It's really easy to do. These buttons should all be lower. I do like how the power switch is an actual physical switch instead of the push and hold nonsense that we usually get these days. Okay, let's keep in mind that this is a relatively low cost device, so we can't go in expecting something like the PlayStation Vita, which still doesn't have ideal button and stick placements. Anyway, let's check out all of the games I received for this system. Atari Collection 1 comes with every version of the Evercade, so let's start here. This has 20 games on it, including Centipede, Adventure, Alien Brigade, Asteroids, Missile Command, Crystal Castles, Food Fight, Desert Falcon, Motor Psycho, Canyon Bomber, Gravitar, Double Dunk, Ninja Gulf, Steeplechase, Night Driver, Tempest, Video Pinball, Aqua Venture, Yars Return, and Sword Quest Earthworld. All of these are original Atari 2600 and 7800 games. The ones that originated in the arcade are represented by the 2600 versions here. Most of these games were before my time, and although I played Atari as a kid, I always enjoyed the games that were in the arcade about a hundred times more. So most of the games that are on this cartridge don't personally appeal to me very much. 
The A button acts as the button in the Atari 2600 games. But be careful, pressing the X button resets the 7800 games and it happened to me more than once because I'm an idiot. Yars Return is on here which was released in 2005. My favorite game on this collection is probably Ninja Golf for the 7800. You hit the ball and you have to deal with ninjas and frogs and other evil things on your way to wherever the ball lies. As a golf game, it's actually not bad. As a ninja game, it kinda gets boring quickly. Interplay Collection 1 comes with the premium version of the Evercade. It has six games including the first Clay Fighter, Earthworm Jim, Battle Chess, Boogerman, Incantation, and Titan. Clay Fighter is the Super Nintendo version and it's not the tournament edition unfortunately. And it plays fine on the Evercade. Earthworm Jim is the Genesis version. I feel this is much better than the Super NES version except for the controls provided here on the Evercade. Even when changing them in the options screen, I can't find anything that works well for this game as I can't set anything to the X button which severely hurts playability. The Super Nintendo version probably would have been preferred because of the control. But actually no, I'll get to that later. Boogerman is the Super Nintendo version and the controls are messed up too. Button A jumps and Button Y attacks. So imagine using your thumb like this for the entire game and no, you cannot change the controls. Incantation is a Super NES game where you control a little wizard. Once again, A jumps and Y attacks which makes playing this one a huge chore. I think I might be able to get into this one a lot more if the button mapping wasn't horrible. Battle Chess seems to be the NES version but I've never played any version before honestly. Regardless, it plays fine if a bit slow. Finally, Titan is an NES game which kind of is a more advanced take on Breakout and also less interesting than Breakout. This cartridge could have been a lot better I feel. Data East Collection 1 is the third game included with the premium pack, and I love Data East. It includes 10 games, Bad Dudes, Burger Time, Midnight Resistance, Side Pocket, Karate Champ, Joe and Mac 2, Fighter's History, Two Crude Dudes, Magical Drop 2, and Burn and Rubber. Sadly, every game on here is the home version instead of the arcade. This is especially disappointing with Two Crude Dudes which went through significant downgrades during the port home. By the way, Two Crude Dudes started out sounding fine, but soon the sound changed to this. Restarting the game fixed it. And while I like the Genesis version of Midnight Resistance more than the arcade version, especially when it comes to the control and the sound, the Evercade button mapping practically ruins the game. I was able to sort of get used to it, but it's still not very optimal at all to be jumping with the Y button. They just didn't put much thought into porting these games, like at all. Side Pocket is the Super Nintendo version and it plays fine. I really enjoy this game. Joe and Mac 2 started out sounding fine, but soon the sound disappeared completely. Overall, there's just so much potential in this package, but they came up short by including the inferior versions of most of the games. And not to mention the horrible button mapping. Round two, fight! Techno's Collection 1 comes with 8 games, Double Dragon, Double Dragon 2, Renegade, Super Spike V-Ball, Super Dodgeball, Crash and the Boys Street Challenge, Super Double Dragon, and River City Ransom. Double Dragon is the NES version and the first thing I notice is that the A and B buttons are backwards. The button labeled A on the Evercade is the same as the button labeled A on the NES pad. That is a huge flaw but for this particular game you can get used to it. Double Dragon 2 however, which is also the NES version, is almost completely broken because of this. On the NES, button B attacks to your left and button A, which is to the right of button B, attacks to your right. It feels very natural. Here it's backwards so the left button attacks to your right and the right button to your left. I can't believe that they didn't catch this and I can't play it well like this at all. Of course, Renegade is the NES port as well and it also suffers from these broken controls. This is a hard enough game as it is. River City Ransom works well enough despite the backwards controls. And that's a good thing too because this is a great game. Super Dodgeball is here in all of its flickering glory and you can't increase the sprite limit on the Evercade. 
I like this game on the Neo Geo, but not really on the NES. And here's Super Double Dragon, which is a Super Nintendo game. This game has absolutely no audio. I rebooted it and then suddenly it had sound. The Super NES emulation seems fine here other than the odd button placement, but that doesn't really hurt this game. And this is a pretty good game, even if it's slow and clunky. I think it might be my favorite one on the cartridge. Still, overall, I don't highly recommend Technos Collection 1. So as you can tell, I have quite a few serious issues so far. But this next collection might be interesting as it has a lot of forgotten games from the 8 and 16-bit eras. Let's check it out. Pico Interactive Collection 1 has 20 games on it. If you didn't know, Pico is a publisher that has been buying up rights to tons of old games, including overseas homebrew games and a few others that were never released. Included here are Switchblade, Dragon View, Top Racer, Power Punch 2, Brave Battle Saga, Eight Eyes, Nightshade, Radical Rex, The Humans, Dork and Imp, I think it's pronounced, Magic Girl, Water Margin, Iron Commando, Draken, Tin Head, The Immortal, Power Pigs of the Dark Age, Canon, Legend of the New Gods, Way of the Exploding Fist, and Jim Power, The Lost Dimensions. You remember Eight Eyes from the NES, of course. I mean, who possibly couldn't? The problem is, is, yep, you guessed it, the controls are now backwards. This seems to be an ongoing theme that plagues all games on the Evercade. Brave Battle Saga is an RPG for the Mega Drive which was translated. The title screen says Legend of the Magic Warrior and the splash screen says Brave Battle Saga. Oh well, whatever. Unfortunately, the game audio soon changed to this. Canon Legend of the New Gods is another translated RPG. This time, the sound went completely away just after starting the game. Jeez. Draken is a very early RPG for the Super Nintendo. I remember renting it and not liking it very much. Interesting that it uses a polygon landscape though. Its pseudo sequel called Dragon View is also here. This one is better and yes, it still uses polygons. It also has side view action sequences which have you jumping with A and attacking with Y. <sighs> Iron Commando is a fairly mediocre and kind of choppy Super Nintendo beat-em-up. Even the Genesis version of The Immortal is here. I'm just amazed that the NES version isn't here instead. The Super NES version of Jim Power is here and it still has the painful scrolling. Now I've heard that they plan to fix this for a future release, but they certainly didn't for this version. Magic Girl is an average vertical shooter for the Mega Drive. It kind of hurts my eyes sometimes with how choppy it can be, but it plays okay. The Genesis version of Radical Rex is on here. I doubt they wanted to use the space it would need for the Sega CD soundtrack, and that's fine, it's just Radical Rex. I started up some Genesis homebrew game called Switchblade. As I was trying to figure out what to do, the sound decided it wanted to fail. Tinhead is on here, and it's the Genesis version. There's not really much more to say about Tinhead that I haven't before. Top Racer used to be Top Gear on the Super Nintendo. I guess they had to rename it for one reason or another. I really like this game. Okay, check out the control setup I chose here. I use the bottom three buttons and have nothing selected for the top button of the diamond configuration. Will the game respect my desired control scheme? No. Gas is where I assigned it. Nitro is where I assigned it, but the brakes are button Y, which is at the top of the diamond configuration. It's like they go out of their way to break the controls for every single game. Water Margin is a homebrew game on the Mega Drive that plays like Knights of the Round from Capcom. We've talked about it before on the show. Next up is Namco Museum Collection 1. This has gotta be good, right? Overall, it has a decent collection of games, I suppose. It has 11 titles, Galaxian, Pac-Man, Xevious, Mappy, Dig Dug, Star Luster, Battle Cars, Metal Marines, Libble Rabble, Quad Challenge, and Mappy Kids. Battle Cards is a Super Nintendo game that was only ever released in North America. Unfortunately, the sound failed soon after I started the game. And then the entire game completely froze. Lovely. Dig Dug is on here. I love Dig Dug, you can't go wrong here. Galaxian is also on here. Of course, these are the NES versions and not the arcade. 
I've never played Libble Rabble before, but here it didn't have any sound at all. Mappy Kids is here, and until now this game was only released in Japan on the Famicom. Unfortunately, the jump and action buttons are backwards here on the Evercade. Metal Marines is a Super NES strategy game, and yet another title that started up with no sound at all. Pac-Man is here, and of course it's the NES version. The Evercade could easily emulate the arcade, but I think it's because they already have an NES emulator and don't want to make an arcade emulator for each game here. I mean, it's a lot cheaper and easier that way. Quad Challenge is a slightly interesting Genesis game that I've always been slightly fascinated with. Slightly. Is Namco Museum Collection 2 any better? Well, at least the sound worked for the first time for every game on this one. This one also has 11 games. Pack Attack, Galaga, Warp Man, Dig Dug 2, The Tower of Druaga, Burning Force, Felios, Weapon Lord, Dragon Spirit, Splatterhouse 2, and Splatterhouse 3. Of course, once again, it's the home versions where applicable. I've always kind of enjoyed Burning Force, and it plays well enough on the Evercade. I still don't like the music in Stage 2 very much, but the other stages make up for it. Pack Attack is an interesting puzzle game that can be pretty fun for a minute or two. Dragon Spirit is here and it's a great game. The NES version is good, but I kind of wish they had a PC Engine emulator for this one. A lot of people really love Weapon Lord, but I could never really get into it no matter how many times I try. The Super Nintendo version is represented here. Warp Man has you controlling what looks like a space dig dug shooting down a prerequisite number of enemies. And Felios is as tough as ever. Okay, okay, I've accepted that all the games need to be the home version if they're based on an arcade game. Also, the best cartridge for the system is coming up in this next segment. It'll be the last collection of games I talk about. Next is Atari Collection 2, which has another 20 games. Basket Brawl, Yars Revenge, Solaris, Centipede again, but this time for the 7800, Asteroids, same deal, Demons to Diamonds, Desert Falcon, Haunted House, Sprint Master, Radar Lock, Millipede, Submarine Commander, Planet Smashers, Real Sports Tennis, Wizard, Air Sea Battle, Bowling, Street Racer, Dark Chambers, and Human Cannonball. Many of the same things that I said about the first collection can be applied here, but this one is definitely a lot more interesting to me. I was intrigued to see more 7800 games on here, like Desert Falcon, which is Atari's answer to Zaxxon. It was also fun playing the upgraded versions of Asteroids and Centipede. Basket Brawl kind of sucks though, as no matter how much I punch the other guys, I can't get the ball. I think somehow I was able to score though. It was probably my teammate that did it. Solaris is an interesting game released late in the life of the 2600. I remember seeing commercials on TV for this one, and I'm gonna have to read the instructions on how to play it so I can figure out what to do. Radar Lock is pretty ambitious for the 2600, but that's not surprising considering it was released in 1989. And of course, the classic, Yars Revenge, is on here. Now it's time for Interplay Collection 2, coming at you with six more games. Claymates, Earthworm Jim 2, Clay Fighter 2, Prehistoric Man, The Adventures of Rad Gravity, and The Brainies. I'll talk about Claymates and Clay Fighter 2 next week on a real Super Nintendo. Earthworm Jim is the Super Nintendo version. Will the controls be as I set them here? Of course not. The gun and weapon select buttons are reversed. You just can't seem to win here. Prehistoric Man is a Super NES game that might be interesting if the button mapping weren't messed up as a result of being on the Evercade. The same thing can be said about Rad Gravity here. The Brainies is a puzzle game where you need to match the colored fuzzball to the same colored disc. It's a pretty simple concept, and fortunately it doesn't suffer from any button layout issues. Overall, this cart really isn't much better than the first Interplay collection. Finally, we have Mega Cat Studios Collection 1. This one offers up 10 indie games. Coffee Crisis, Old Towers, Tanzer, Little Medusa, Super Painter, Multi-Dude, Almost Hero, 
Creepy Brawlers, Justice Duel, and Log Jammers. Almost Hero is on the NES and it's inspired by River City Ransom. The fighting action is kind of stiff, but I found the dialogue as you're fighting pretty funny. It seems like a good one to spend some time with. Creepy Brawlers is basically a boxing game like Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, except creepy instead. Coffee Crisis is a Genesis beat-em-up. You control baristas out to save the world from aliens and people who are possessed. I really like the animation in this one, but sometimes the control feels a touch unresponsive. Justice Duel has you playing historical figures like Abraham Lincoln, who of course is a robot. You basically just shoot down enemies. I got bored pretty fast with this one as there's not a lot of variety. Log Jammers is an NES game that seems to be inspired by Wind Jammers on the Neo Geo, except that this one is really twitchy and hard to play. Little Medusa is a Genesis game where you need to turn creatures to stone and then push them so that they make bridges. Then you collect the stars to complete the level. One hit and you need to start all over again though, and it's really easy to get hit. As a result, I didn't care much for this one, but it shows potential. Multi-Dude is for the NES and has you pressing buttons to switch between two dudes to get to the exit. A much better game is Old Tower, which is similar but has an automatic dashing concept. This one is for the Genesis and you need to collect all of the coins before the exits light up. Sometimes you have to switch back and forth between dudes. I played this one for a while and I definitely recommend it. The music is really good too, so that helps. Super Painter is an NES game where you need to color the gray blocks by touching them and then proceed to the exit. Simple concept and I like it. You can jump over enemies as well. I played this one for longer than I thought I would. And last, we have Tanzer, where the audio messed up right away in the title screen. I really wanted to play this, so I restarted it. And the audio messed up again. Okay, gonna try once more. All right, third time's a charm, I guess. Anyway, this game is awesome. And look, I can actually assign the buttons the way I want on the Evercade, meaning that it plays perfectly here. Well, except for the aforementioned sound issues. You run along slashing enemies and collecting gold. The control is quite good. The graphics are on the minimal side, but still pleasant. The music is fantastic. I want this game on my real Genesis. You only get one life, and as I was taken back to the title screen, the audio did this. Yikes. Overall, I'd say that this was probably my favorite cartridge for the Evercade. And there you go, that's the Evercade for you. You know, I can forgive that they only have the home versions on here, that helps keep the cost low, and I can even forgive the shimmering scrolling and the blurry Genesis graphics. What I cannot forgive is that they don't allow you to remap the buttons on a system-wide level. I mean, what the hell, that is a serious overlook. Hopefully this can be fixed with a firmware update, but I don't even know if that's possible. Anyway, what do you guys think of the Evercade? Are you gonna get one? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. You know, these Evercade cartridges kind of look like the cartridges that go into the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Well, you don't think. Whoa! Neo Turf Masters on the Neo Geo Pocket has never been so intense! Next game! This metal slug on the Neo Geo Pocket being played on the Evercade! The Intense! That's right, I'm probably losing my mind. Oh well.
No big loss. Whoa!